Joining me now for more is Denver Riggleman. He's a former Republican congressman who served as a critical advisor to the 1-6 committee. He's author, he's also the author, excuse me, of the amazing book, The Breach, the untold story of the investigation into January 6th. Denver, my friend, it's great to have you back on the show. You know, the last time you were here, there were so many questions that we didn't have time to get to, so I want to tackle them now, starting with the John Eastman emails. Are you in the very least surprised at all by what we learned following Judge Carter's ruling on Wednesday? Oh, and great to be here. Thanks. And not surprised at all. You know, when you looked at the even the original text message, you have members of the, uh, I'm talking about the Meadows text messages, you have members of the Council for National Policy. You have other legal entities talking about what they want to do with alternate electors. Uh, and, and a lot of it went right back to Eastman. So for me, uh, sort of seeing the validation of what we saw even over a year ago, and now looking at all the individuals that were connected to Eastman, whether it's the Council for National Policy or Jenny Thomas, other individuals like that, and the emails that were sent to multiple states for alternate electors, to me, it's not a surprise at all, Katie. And, and, and frankly, I'm darn pleased that uh, those emails are going to the committee. Deborah, let's talk about that Trump subpoena that we mentioned in the intro to your interview. First, I don't think he's going to voluntarily appear. I know there's some negotiations and a discussion about him appearing live. But when he does, I'm frankly not sure he's going to tell the truth. So I want to focus with you, Denver, on the document production part of that subpoena. If you were drafting that subpoena, and I know you did a lot of the subpoena drafting when you were serving on the 1-6 committee, what would you request Donald Trump to produce to the 1-6 committee? I think it's all about his communications. I would want to know what other types of cell phones he had on him or who actually did the communications with him. I would certainly want to see if there was any texting. Now, I think that... To be honest, I think President Trump probably had pretty good operational security, but I'd also want to see what other phones he might have been through or been working through, like Dan Scavino. We still don't have Mark Meadows CDRs, where the committee doesn't, the call detail records. So I'd ask for all the call detail records around him and who he actually dictated to as far as telephone calls and things like that. And the last thing I would do is I would get a listing of all the White House phone numbers that were connected to people of interest, right? Go through and see what all the White House route numbers were. And right, Katie, so we want to know who was talking to those people on the ground, whether they were rally planners, even right-wing extremists, or people connected to them, right, um, that we have direct links to. So I think all those things is what I would look at on the technical side and the data side. Um, if you're looking at questions that I would want to ask outside of technical and data, is what he knew when he knew it, right? It's not just the 187 minutes, you know, Katie. Me and you know there's that seven hours and 37 minute period where they, you know, there was nothing on the call logs and call diaries. What I would want to identify is every single phone call that happened in that seven hours and 37 minutes, who he talked to and who the people around him talked to and what we haven't seen as far as data. So those are just, my gosh, Katie, that was probably really way too long of an answer, but those are some of the things that I would want to see immediately. Well, no, Denver, it's not too long of an answer because I think it kind of dovetails nicely into my next question to you, which is generally your assessment of the 1-6 committee overall. Um, you're a data guy. You're an investigator. You know exactly that it takes every stone turned over looking to see where does that next thread take us based upon what we find I know that there was a captive amount of time and resources for this one committee. We've talked about it briefly before, but I'd like to ask you, Denver Riggleman, what do you see as the most overlooked aspect of the committee's investigation thus far? Well, goodness, and they have done a great job. It's not, um, it's not that they haven't done a great job. For me, I just look at things differently based on my background. You know, the military and government trained me this way, Katie. And what I think has been overlooked or what we need to look at further over the next six months to a year or longer is the command and control network, right? I want to know, you know, what those White House numbers were. I want to know how those right-wing extremist groups were connected intimately. We have tens of millions of lines of data. We've already done an incredible job at the centers of gravity with Oak Keepers and Proud Boys and other right-wing extremist groups that were connected. But how did the rally planners talk to those individuals, right? If you're talking about the certain groups that were getting money, how did the money flow between these groups? And I think those things we need to look at a lot more in depth because I do believe uh, we are lacking some of the data with the White House call managers on who exactly was calling who. For instance, you know, Katie, Kelly Sorrell was texting with Andrew Giuliani. 
Why haven't we looked at the phone numbers that Bianca Garcia was calling, you know, the Latinos for Trump and her direct contacts with Rhodes and with Tario? And again, I think, again, that phone call from the White House to a rider is still very important. And I know it's very difficult to get that data sometimes. I know the data is perishable. It's been, it's been a while. But that was my warning at yeah. the beginning. Data is where we need to go. And I think we need to look at some of those things in the command and control element. Well, and, you know, Denver, to your point, data has, I guess what I would say, a certain integrity to it and that it's supposed to be objective. So regardless of what party you belong to, if you can look at objective data, it'll be able to point you in the direction of the people and the who, the what, the why, the when and the how. How do you have some optimism, though, that, again, because the 1-6 committee kind of operated under a very kind of narrow window of time and opportunity that perhaps the DOJ, for example, in its sprawling investigation from the ground round up in terms of foot soldiers all the way up, do you obtain or keep some optimism that perhaps the DOJ is looking into the connections that you brought to the table through your extensive research in creating that monster chart of everybody and the links between them? I have to give credit to the telephone team. You know, I, I feel pretty proud that I built them, Katie, but those those guys are brilliant, right? And, you know, to have the hundreds of records that we had and for them to merge different types of formats, I think is, is very important to recognize in that group and to thank them. Um, listen, you know, we're at a stage now with that, with that amount of data and what we're doing that the DOJ and FBI have to take charge. You know, Congress has limited authorities. We can't get certain types of data. This isn't a criminal investigation. It's for the public trust. So my hope is that there's a data tiger team, that Congress is sharing data with the DOJ and FBI and vice versa, if applicable. Um, if they're doing that, I'm telling you right now, Katie, the amount of data that we have, if DOJ has the extra things that the committee wasn't allowed to get based on law, and they can merge that with the data and the monster graph you talk about, I think we can do some real damage uh, to the command and control and to, you know, sort of to the, the, the I would say the white nationalist belly crawlers, you know, that were out there that day. And uh, that's just something I really look forward to. And I hope in the future that I can be a part of that. I mean, listen, I was doing this before the January 6th committee and I'll be doing it afterwards. Uh, I feel this is very important that we figure this out. And Denver, you mentioned the white nationalists and rebellies that were there that day. It was not just that day on 1-6. I want to get into a part of your book that really caught my eye. It's about the rise of Christian nationalism within the Republican Party and the role that that played on January 6th. I feel like, Denver, that this is such an underestimated threat, this movement of Christian nationalism, which I think is a disgusting kissing cousin to white nationalism, right? This idea that Christianity and nationalism are completely inextricably intertwined. It's definitely had a foothold in the United States, but I feel like people are loud and proud about it, and they're not embarrassed to be able to put it out there. Can you talk a little bit about what you feel is the biggest threat that comes from this particular movement? I think I never thought, Katie, that Jesus would be a bully, right? And I think that's the issue is you have individuals self-identifying as Christian nationalists, anybody from Marjorie Taylor Greene to Mike Flynn. Um, the biggest issue that you have there is they believe that good against evil rationalizes any act that they do. It validates whatever action they have to take in order to fulfill whatever vision they believe is correct, regardless of the freedom of thought or the other religious you know, individuals, or even people who don't have a religious belief. They believe that they have primacy over those individuals, which I, I think is as anti-American as you can get. Listen, we're in the land of religious liberty. I'm a religious freedom guy. You've read the book. You know where I came from. I came from a very religious family. Um, my thing is that I think freedom of thought and the fact that the founders wanted that separation of church and state is so vitally important to the way we conduct our business as a republic. And if you think that you know, your way or the highway is the way to go. And you believe that violence is the way to do that. That is the most anti-Christian thing I can imagine. An individual saying that, hey, you know, I'm a Christian nationalist. This is the way it has to be. All of our laws and rules have to be biblically based. That is not what America is about. And I think when you have people who believe this battle against good and evil allows them to dehumanize others, right, to call me the tool of the Antichrist, right, uh, to call my wife the spawn of Satan, right, all of this, or a globalist, or, you know, even in a pejorative sense, you know, being called a secret Jew, which I was called to my face, you know, um, and the fact is, you know, I'm like, what is the wrong, what's the bad thing about being Jewish? Are you, wh how did, how is that a bad thing, right? Or, or the worst thing to be called, Katie, you know, the worst thing I was called in Republican circles, I was called a secret Democrat. Now that's, you know, I, I just went over, you know, over the, <laughs> there. So 
But, you know, that's that's the issue that you have is that there is no way on earth I'm going to allow anybody under any banner to bully anybody. I think that's the worst thing we can have as Americans. And I don't give a rat's if you're a Republican, Democrat, independent, green, libertarian. I just don't care. I think anybody who says it's my way or the highway and every action validates where I want to go as far as an objective. That means, you know, I'm going to I'm going to be your enemy in a policy and ideological way if, if, if you're wired that way. Devin, very quickly, before I have to let you go, let's talk about the fact that you've taken the blinders off and you're definitely embracing democracy and democratic candidates. Let's shift to the midterm elections. That's less than three weeks away. You cut an ad for a fellow Virginian Democratic Congresswoman, Abigail Spanberger. Let's play a quick uh, part of that ad. This is not a typical political ad. I'm a Republican congressman saying nice things about a Democrat. In Congress, the parties sit apart and don't work together, except Abigail Spanberger. She's trying to change Congress and make it work, and she's ranked the most bipartisan member of Congress from Virginia and fifth in the country. In the CIA, Abigail worked counterterrorism. She puts country first. That's why I support Abigail. I'm Abigail Spanberger, and I approve this message. You know, Denver Spanberger, she's in a bit of a tight race, as several other Democrats are. But what compelled you, former Republican? I know you haven't left the party, but what compelled you to endorse her reelection campaign? Yeah, and I am an independent now. I said I was unaffiliated. And uh, I think the reason, Katie, that I did that is I just don't want anybody who lives in a fantasy based community to be representing anybody in our Commonwealth. And Abby is so facts based. She tries to work across the aisle. She's a great person. But why did I really do it? Because facts based needs to destroy the facts challenged. That's the way we have to do this here in America. And if if people have a problem with it, you know they're going to call me a globalist. I've sold out, right? I'm, I'm awful. I'm evil now. And I don't care. You know, I just want people that actually tell the truth. They live in, they live in a facts-based world, and uh, they actually acknowledge that the election wasn't stolen. I think that's a baseline we can all agree with. Well, Denver Riggleman, I don't care what they say about you. You're always welcome to hang out with me. They don't always say the nicest things about me either, so you and I will be keeping some good company. Denver Riggleman, thank you, my friend, for joining us today. I appreciate you. Thank you so much.